Hello, this is the last lesson in this series on chest x-rays. In this lesson, I will not be introducing any new material. Instead, it will be a self-assessment to test your attention and your ability to apply everything you've learned from the preceding nine videos. I'll be presenting 15 cases. Each case includes a very brief clinical vignette, including components of the physical exam and an accompanying x-ray. After I show each case, I strongly recommend pausing the video to review each case and radiograph as long as necessary in order for you to generate your own idea about what's going on with the patient. As with radiology interpretation in real life, I'll then first discuss the relatively objective radiographic findings uh, each film demonstrates, and then provide the more subjective impression of the diagnosis, which will incorporate the broader clinical context. The cases will get progressively more challenging uh, throughout the lesson, so don't worry if you find the first several to be too easy. Finally, uh, I wanted to really use these 15 examples to provide a nice comprehensive summary of the course and also to demonstrate a broad range of pathology. Unfortunately, the trade-off is that this lesson is a bit longer than the others, so as you've probably already seen, I've split it into two parts. Case 1. A 65-year-old smoker presents with four weeks of hemoptysis and progressive dyspnea. Feel free to pause the video here. So the primary radiographic finding in this first case isn't exactly subtle. There is complete whiteout of the right hemithorax with rightward deviation of the trachea, as well as the entire mediastinum. The left lung appears normal. What are some conditions that might cause this? If we pull up the differential diagnosis for tracheal shifts from lesson four, we see that they are divided into those which cause the trachea to be deviated away from the abnormal side and those which cause it to be deviated towards the abnormal side, as in this case. Since there is not any history provided of prior lung surgery, and neither pleural nor pulmonary fibrosis would cause a lung whiteout, right lung collapse is really the only possibility. Why would someone develop a complete lung collapse? In the setting of a smoker who is presenting with a subacute history of hemoptysis, the most likely explanation is an endobronchial lung cancer. Case 2. A 23-year-old woman, recently returned from a trip to Africa, presents with four weeks of cough, intermittent fever, and weight loss. The first thing you probably noticed was the dense opacification of the right lower lung field on the PA film. Examining the lateral film, we see that the patient has an opacity in the inferior posterior part of the lung. Thus, this opacity is in the right lower lobe. This is a great example of the spine sign in which there is an interruption in the normal progression to increasing lucency as one moves inferiorly down the spine on the lateral film. In addition, this opacity is well-defined and dense enough to be referred to as a consolidation. On the PA film, if you examine this area more closely, I think you may be able to make out an air bronchogram. What is the etiology of this focal lung opacity? Let's take a look at the etiologies of focal lung opacities from Lesson 8. In this case, pneumonia is by far the most likely. The patient is too young for malignancy to be likely. She has no suggestion in the history or exam of a DVT or PE. And the remaining diagnoses are much less common. In Lesson 8, I also discussed five radiographic subtypes of pneumonia. In this case, the consolidation is dense, appears to conform to the general shape of the right lower lobe, and there is no suggestion of cavitation. Therefore, this is a lobar pneumonia. In addition, although it is much more subtle, there appears to be the additional finding of some fullness just to the right of the trachea, which in the context of a probable pneumonia is most likely to be paratracheal lymphadenopathy. So in summary, the primary findings are a right lower lobe consolidation and possible right paratracheal lymphadenopathy. The impression, given the patient's history and exam, is that the patient has a right lower lobe lobar pneumonia.
Lobar pneumonia is most commonly seen in the context of a community-acquired pneumonia caused by strep pneumoniae or uh, another relatively common pathogen like that. However, in this case, given the relatively long duration of symptoms, cachexia, and recent travel to an endemic area, tuberculosis should also be a strong consideration. Case 3. A 38-year-old man with IV drug abuse presents to the ER with fever and a new heart murmur, suspected to be secondary to endocarditis, who developed progressive hypotension and respiratory distress over the first 12 hours after admission. So before talking about the findings, let's discuss the technical quality of the film, as it's obviously worse than the first two cases. First of all, the patient is rotated, not just around one axis, but around two. He's rotated with his right side lower than his left, which is generally a non-issue. However, if you look at how the spinous processes in the cervical spine relate to the clavicular heads, you can see how the spinous processes are much closer to the left clavicle, which means the left shoulder is rotated forward relative to the right. This can impact assessment of the cardiac and mediastinal silhouette. In addition, the vertebral bodies are not visible behind the heart, which suggests that there is suboptimal penetration or level of contrast. The final observation regarding the technical quality of the film is that the inferior portion of the thorax is cut off the bottom of the film altogether, limiting evaluation of the diaphragm. Now moving on to the actual findings, there are obvious diffuse bilateral patchy alveolar opacities with probable bilateral effusions. So what's causing those opacities? The etiologies of diffuse alveolar opacities can be divided into two categories. First, there is cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which is associated with an elevated pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which is a surrogate for left atrial pressure. Any cause of CHF can lead to cardiogenic edema. The other category is predictably non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which has a normal wedge pressure. Diffuse non-cardiogenic edema is often placed into the spectrum between the clinical entities of acute lung injury and acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. The distinction between ALI and ARDS is simply based on how hypoxemic the patient is. There are many etiologies of non-cardiogenic edema, most notably severe sepsis, pneumonia, and aspiration pneumonitis. So how can we tell the difference between cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic edema? Here's a chart from Lesson 7 outlining those differences. In the case of this x-ray, the cardiac size is normal, the regional distribution of opacities is patchy, we can see an air bronchogram right here, and there isn't any parabronchial cuffing. Regarding the last distinction, since there are probably pleural effusions but no obvious curly B lines, that gets split down the middle. Overall, though, it should be clear that this is most likely non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Why does he have non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema? It's most likely from ARDS in the setting of severe sepsis. Finally, there is the issue of the endotracheal tube. The tip of the tube should be placed about 5 centimeters away from the carina. There isn't a ruler shown here on the film, but if you had to guess, it's probably about right. Case 4. A 68-year-old man presented to the ER two days ago with dyspnea and weight loss, found to have a large left pleural effusion, which was drained via chest tube. He initially felt improved, but then abruptly developed severe shortness of breath and hypotension. So there's obviously a couple things going on here. Starting on the patient's left, we can see that where the left lung is supposed to be, it is completely devoid of lung markings, thus a large pneumothorax. This appears to be related to some technical problem with the chest tube, which is coiled up at the bottom of the film and appears to be extra thoracic. That is, it looks like it just fell out. As bad as a pneumothorax this large would be for the patient normally, his situation is even worse as the rightward shift of the heart and mediastinal structures strongly suggests he has a tension pneumothorax. In a tension pneumothorax, air can continue to leak into the pleural space, but it can't get out. As the pressure builds, it shoves everything else out of the way and impairs cardiac filling to the point that cardiac output and thus blood pressure start to drop. This is a true emergency, 
in which the patient may have only minutes to have the lung decompressed before arresting. After that, the other major finding is almost like an afterthought, but the right lung is highly abnormal as well, containing innumerable tiny pulmonary nodules. There isn't really any radiographic clues as to the etiology, and even given the history of significant weight loss, this still could be anything from diffuse metastatic disease to miliary tuberculosis. In the case of this patient, a subsequent colonoscopy found a large adenocarcinoma, and PET scan found diffuse metastases throughout the body. Case 5. A 76-year-old woman presents with one week of progressive dyspnea and bilateral leg swelling. She reports her medical history is most notable for some type of heart valve surgery 30 years ago. The first thing you probably noticed is her cardiac silhouette looks large. The cardiothoracic ratio is equal to the maximum horizontal cardiac width divided by the maximum horizontal thoracic width as measured between the inner rib margins. Cardiomegaly is considered to be present if this ratio is greater than 50% on a PA film, which it clearly is in this case. While on the subject of heart size, a much more subtle finding has to do with the airways. In Lesson 5, I discussed how splaying of the carinal angle, that is the angle between the right and left main stem bronchi, beyond 90 degrees is suggestive of left atrial enlargement. Next, there are some sternotomy wires, and right in the middle of the cardiac silhouette appears to be some form of foreign body, which looks awfully suspicious for an artificial heart valve. If we compare the silhouette of that valve against some examples of various types and designs, does it look similar to any of them? To me, it looks like a cage ball valve. And which valve has been replaced? Recall that if we take the cardiac silhouette and draw an imaginary line bisecting the spine, the valve that is closest to the middle is the aortic. The one that is down and to the patient's right is the tricuspid. The one down and to the patient's left is mitral. And up and to the left is pulmonic. In addition, comparing just the aortic and mitral valves, the aortic valve tends to be viewed more on the side from the PA view, while the mitral is seen more on face. Considering all of that leads us to conclude that it's the mitral valve that has been replaced. Finally, two last subtle findings are mild blunting of the right costophrenic angle, suggesting a very small effusion, and there is debatably some perihilar alveolar opacities. So putting this all together, the primary findings are cardiomegaly, possible left atrial enlargement, a caged ball mechanical mitral valve replacement, a small right pleural effusion, and mild bilateral perihilar alveolar opacities. Considering the patient is presenting with one week of dyspnea and bilateral leg edema, and has an elevated JVP on exam, the most likely explanation is a mild CHF exacerbation. It's unclear from the available information as to whether or not the MVR is playing a role. Although caged ball valves are extremely durable and have an essentially 0% rate of mechanical failure, they can develop blood clots and deformations of the ball, leading to mitral regurgitation. Case 6. A 45-year-old man with alcohol dependence presents with two weeks of productive cough and high fevers. So on the PA film, there is clearly a mass-like lesion apparent with an air fluid level. And here it is on the lateral film. Before we decide what it is, let's decide where exactly it is. At first glance, from the PA view, it appears to be in the right middle lobe, since the right middle lobe is adjacent to the right heart border. However, on the lateral view, the right middle lobe never reaches as posteriorly as this lesion is located the right lower lobe is actually the correct location. So what is this right lower lobe lesion? Well, from lesson eight, here's our list of cavitating lung lesions. Aside from the fact that the patient is an alcoholic and thus more prone to aspiration, there's nothing else that points to a specific diagnosis. Considering them just the most common, it is probably one of the top four on the list. So in summary, the patient has a cavitary lung lesion with an air fluid level in the right lower lobe, which is most likely due to pneumonia versus lung abscess versus tuberculosis versus a solitary lung metastasis.
Case 7. A 55-year-old non-smoker with no significant past medical history presents with two months of progressive dyspnea. There's a diffuse lung process present, slightly more prominent on the patient's right side. Is this an alveolar process or an interstitial process? Here's a chart from Lesson 7 to help distinguish those two possibilities. The most helpful distinction in this film is this one. Are the margins sharp or hazy? And these opacities, relatively speaking, are sharply defined, particularly when compared to the ARDS example in Case 3. If you recall, interstitial opacities are usually further subdivided into reticular opacities if there are too many lines, nodular opacities if there are too many dots, and reticulonodular opacities if there are too many of both. In this case, it seems to be a predominantly reticular pattern. Here's the differential diagnosis of predominantly reticular interstitial opacities. Although I don't think this was mentioned in any of the earlier lessons, this patient has a slight subpleural predominance of the opacities, which mostly suggests idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and rheumatoid arthritis associated interstitial lung disease. Since there is no mention of history or exam findings suggestive of RA, either IPF or hypersensitivity pneumonitis are the most likely diagnoses. Finally, there is a slightly widened mediastinum. A normal mediastinum should be less than 8 cm in width, though this number is not accurate when the patient is rotated, as this one appears to be. So we can't be sure of whether the mediastinum is truly wide, although this, this area right here and its inferior extension looks a little suspicious for an aortic aneurysm or just a tortuous aorta, though this could be an artifact from the rotation. So in summary, the primary findings are diffuse, subpleural, reticular opacities and a possible widened mediastinum. The impression is interstitial lung disease, most likely IPF or hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and a possibly widened mediastinum from either a tortuous aorta or mild aortic aneurysm. Case 8. A 74-year-old woman, status post a dual-chamber pacemaker implantation for sick sinus syndrome, who is now presenting with syncope. The first thing to notice here is that there is something fishy about the wires coming out of the generator, particularly this structure here. What is that? That is actually a fragment of the right ventricular lead, which seems to not be present along its usual course in the subclavian vein and SVC. But if we look down here, there's the lead coiled up in the right ventricle, and it may even be looping back through the tricuspid valve into the right atrium. It's kind of hard to tell. So what this woman has isn't just a simple lead fracture, the lead retains its normal position, but instead the wire has migrated distally. It can probably be retrieved from here, but it will be very difficult. And since a broken pacing wire can't conduct signal, it's no surprise the patient is bradycardic and syncopizing. That's it for part one of this final lesson on interpreting chest x-rays. Click in the corner to advance to part two.